on the final play. Edmonds, he's got some running room left side as the first down, scampering down the sideline inside the 10, five, touchdown. The Saints ran wild in Buffalo to win their seventh straight game in emphatic and historic fashion. We'll have reaction from the team as well as analysis from Jim Henderson, who called the game. Tipped and intercepted, Sheldon Rankins plus. Stood up, stood up, he didn't get it, he didn't get it, he didn't get it. This one belongs to the Wayne. Tulane accomplished a historic win in dramatic fashion, and LSU and Nickel State took care of business as well. We'll catch you up on all the college football, and we'll bring you the best of the best from the prep football playoffs. And the Pelicans plan to climb in the standings. For us, we're just trying to put a string of wins together. You know, we did a great job on the road going three and one and coming back. We gotta take care of home court. From Fox 8 Sports, this is the final play. Sponsored by your Southern Quality Ford dealer, built for tough, and Nissan. Welcome into the final play. I'm Juan Kincaid, and cool weather is overrated when it comes to this edition of the Saints. The win streak is now seven games, and for weeks we've been hearing Drew Brees say he's still waiting for the team to play a complete game. Today in Buffalo, the Saints played their most complete game of the season. Sean Vazan gets us started tonight. Be the Saints. Yep. Just be the Saints. Yep. Play with our edge. Yep. Show them how that. Show them how hungry we are to get this win. This team had lost the game at home. That changes today. The Saints enter the cold of Buffalo Sunday, knowing they'd have to beat the elements in a Bills team that hadn't lost in this building all year long. They responded with dominance and completely dismantled Buffalo. 47-10. You do this long enough and every once in a while you find yourself on both ends of this type of game. If there was ever a game where the MVP was the offensive line, this was it. The Saints front five owned the line of scrimmage, which paved the way for 298 rushing yards on 48 carries and six touchdowns, a new franchise record. We get the game plan, we study it, you know, we understand kind of what we want to do, and then it's kind of up to us to do it. And we're just doing a, a better job, I guess, of following through with that. Definitely a fun game when, you, when you're able to run for, you know, over 300 yards, and, um, you know, it felt great. Uh, everyone was out there doing their job, and, you know, executing the game plan. The ground game was so strong, the Saints had not one, but 200-yard rushers. Mark Ingram led the way with 131 yards and three touchdowns, while Alvin Kamara added 106 yards and a touchdown of his own. It's a blessing, man. Man, God is good, man. We just had emphasis on committing to the run, you know, for a long time, and uh, we've been committing to it uh, offensively, coaches as a scheme, players buying into the scheme, and um, Receivers, tight ends, fullback, all the O-line. They're giving us some good teams to run through, and we're just trying to make it happen. And like in 2009 when they beat the Bills here, Drew Brees didn't have to take over. Instead, he was efficient. He didn't throw a touchdown pass, but did get one on the ground late in the third, capping a 10-play, 94-yard drive where not a single pass was thrown. I felt Teron, who had been blocking his guy, and then he's running with me, and there's always that fine line of, don't want to be downfield, right? So I'm going to kind of stay with my quarterback. And, and then I felt him just go um, at, uh, I think, one of the linebackers who was starting to kind of feel like maybe I was going to be a run threat. And I just felt like he just kind of leveled him. And I thought, well, OK, well, now it's time to run. <laughs> so I uh, was able to sneak in. Plus, I felt like I owed that to the running back since they did all the work to, you know, run the ball down there that, that we needed another rushing touchdown. On defense, they were equally impressive. After allowing a field goal on Buffalo's opening drive, they didn't allow a single point again until their final one. They shut down Tyrod Taylor and contained LaShawn McCoy. Sheldon Rankins had one of his best games, finishing with one sack and one interception. They have been running that little passing concept with the tight end dropping out like that. Like, probably did it a couple plays before. So uh, when they called, when we got our defensive call, um, and I had to drop back, I kind of just figured where I'd be dropping back to. Um, broke on the ball, he bobbled it, made a play on it, and, uh, and then it was a great day to be me. That's all, that's all I'll say that. Now the Saints are rolling. They've won seven straight and are playing with the confidence of a contender. I think um, when, whenever you taste success and, and you're able to do it, time and again it just it builds a level of confidence and belief in the process and the system and, and what we're building and I think that obviously we went out and made 
some additions through free agency. We made some additions with our rookie draft class, guys that have you know contributed quite a bit. Um, so you know, add add all that stuff together and maybe catching some breaks along the way that we haven't caught in a long time, a long time. Um, that's resulting in wins. Now I'm joined by the voice of the Saints, Jim Henderson. And Jim, I know you've seen a lot of good games, a lot of bad games. Uh, that was one dominant performance by the Saints here uh, in Buffalo. Was that what you were expecting today? Oh, not at all. And this is a good team that they faced. When you come into a place where no visitor had won this year and you win by 37 points against a good team in fairly cold weather conditions, that was a statement game, if not to the rest of the NFL, at least to the Saints themselves, that they can come into hostile territory and play as good a football as I've ever seen a Saints team play. And what has been the two biggest knocks of the Sean Payton era? They can't run the ball. They don't play defense. Check check they dispelled both of those myths here today they ran, ran the ball for over 300 yards today i'm sure your colleague deuce McAllister was loving this type of game yeah he was i mean six touchdowns on the ground that long drive in which they never threw a pass and drew ran it in from seven yards out i mean total domination on the ground and, and what another knock against this football team was they can't win outside, and they did that. They can't win in cold weather. Now, the conditions were about as benign as you're going to find for the middle of November in Buffalo, but they dispelled all those things. And this was not a team playing out the string in the 15th game of the season. This is a team that's hot on the heels of the New England Patriots in the AFC East, and they got totally taken apart in front of their home fans. Yeah, and look, this crowd was into it for a while, and then all of a sudden, by halftime, they were done. Um, but it, I felt like if there was ever a game where an offensive line just truly was the MVP. This would have been it. I, I can't recall the time the Saints offensive line just literally took over a game the way they did today. Totally did. I mean, Teron Armstead is one of many parts of that offensive line, but it's such a difference when he's in there. I mean, the pass protection was terrific. They ran the ball so much. I mean, like Drew said on that 10 play drive where they never threw a pass, they, I don't know if they even faced a third down. You know, they were just getting so many chunk plays on first and second down. The chains kept moving. Uh, they just played spectacular football. Won't always be like that, but it's awfully good tonight. And, and defensively, they just they just keep churning and I gotta give you credit because you said before the game this offense is basically LaShawn McCoy and Tyrod Taylor scrambles and you were dead on because I, I, I kept that kind of mentally in my mind as the game was flowing and if Tyrod Taylor wasn't slipping out and kind of getting that leaky yards on a scramble or LaShawn McCoy breaking one for a big game this offense was really pretty pretty average yeah you know McCoy it might be the only time I've ever seen a team facing the Saints with only one true running back. Mm -hmm. He was the only running back they had. Now, they used Tolbert a little in that position, but he's primarily a fullback and short yardage guy. And it didn't look like LaShawn McCoy really wanted to play that badly after that first quarter. He got bumped around a lot. He's their leading receiver. He's their leading rusher. When you shut him down, you pretty much shut them down. Tyrod Taylor is a guy that can extend plays, but will take sacks because he is trying to extend plays. He's kind of slippery in the pocket, but he's also small. You saw the, the Saints get their hands on the ball defensively with their pass rush because he can't see throwing lanes very well unless he gets to the edge. So they had a great game plan against him. What did he look downfield like one time in the first three quarters? I mean, everything was five, six, eight yards downfield. So uh, he was he was threatened by this pass rush. The Saints coverage was as good as it's ever been. They played without Kenny Vaccaro and they didn't miss a beat. No doubt about that. That was the one injury I was concerned with. Uh, now, this is the game of football. Sometimes injuries happen. I want to pass on some information to Daniel Lasco, according to Sean Payton. Uh, there's positive signs uh, in terms of him. He's, he was at a local hospital. Um, when you were calling that, what, what did you see on that play? Well, Deuce saw him go down and, and said, you know, he tackled badly. He kept his head down when he made a tackle, and that can be very serious very when you do. And the fact that he didn't move at all from the second he went down had everybody concerned. You could certainly see that on the field, but I think he did give a thumbs up to people as he came off, so hopefully he'll be all right. I mean, this guy makes his living on special teams, so if he can't come back and contribute in that way, it's very difficult. Jim, seven wins in a row. We've been saying after one win, yeah, but. After two wins, yeah, but. After three wins, yeah, but. After four wins, yeah, but. After five <laughs> wins, yeah, but. We're up to number seven here. Any, any of those yeah, but excuses are out the window now. This team's for real. I think it is, too. And I asked Deuce, is it time to get excited yet? And he kind of grudgingly admitted it is. You know, after those first two games, I think we were all surprised when this team won two or three in a row. Mm -hmm. To have won seven in a row, to be in the position they're in, to play as well as any team in the NFL is, I think you have to acknowledge they're for real. Uh, this reminds me so much, and I hate to say it, of 2009. We played here in 2009, too. 
came away with a big victory, and Greg Williams got the game ball for the Saints as the former head coach of the Bills. You could have dispensed a lot of game balls today. Yeah, there's no doubt about that. Saints are 7-2. and two. They keep on rolling. I enjoyed my first trip to Buffalo, Jim. I really did. It's a nice town. Isn't Not it? a bad place to It'll be. It'll be snowing here starting tomorrow probably for the next six months. Well, I'm glad we're getting out of town now. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Yep. All right. Of course, much more from Jim starting Monday morning here on Fox 8. 8 a.m. Black and Gold Rewind. 5 p.m. Commentary. 10.35 p.m. The Black and Gold Review Show. Submit questions via the Final Word feature on the Final Play app. Still a lot more Saints to talk about here on the Final Play, including Chris Hagan taking a look at the drive that defined the game. And later, it was another winning weekend for many of our college football teams, including LSU blowing out Arkansas and Tulane winning a wild one on the road. We'll recap that and much more when the final play continues. Our catch of the week is a no-brainer because when a big man shows good hands, you give him credit. Third quarter and defensive tackle Sheldon Rankin dropping in coverage because it's what he does. And good thing because look what he found. A tip drill pick for number 98. All that remained was seeing if the big guy can get into the end zone. The high school running back could not, but that is still our catch of the day. There were so many things the Saints did right in Buffalo today, but the game can really be summed up with one particular drive. Here's Chris Hagan. Midway through the third quarter, the Saints held a 30-3 lead, and things couldn't possibly be going any better. So they thought. Over the next 10 plays, the black and gold flexed their might in a way that should put the entire league on notice. I was waiting for, you know, the play call to come in, and, you know, you... We, we never really encountered any third down situations in that drive. That's because Alvin Kamara, Mark Ingram, and the Saints' powerful offensive line wouldn't let them. Down after down, the black and gold ripped off chunks of yardage on the ground. When we was in the locker room, we said, we got we to gotta put, put the uh, pressure on them and yep. break their neck. Yep. So coming out, being able to get those run looks and, and, and get some good hits. Mark had some hits. I had some hits. I mean, it's a credit to the old line. Averaging more than nine yards per carry on the drive, the Saints couldn't be stopped. Even fullback Zach Line was chewing through the Bills' front seven. You know, at that point in the game, we wanted to uh, keep it on the ground, and you know, guys, guys were all, you know, working hard to, you know, end up in the end zone. But before reaching the end zone, Breeze finally heard his number called. We get down inside the ten yard line, and he calls a pass play. And it's funny because in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, man, we. How mad are these running backs going to be? We, we, we've run the ball all the way down the field, and then we're going to throw a touchdown um, to cap it off. But when things are going your way without having to put the ball in the air, sometimes you just go with it. I tried. I scrambled around as long as I could to try to find somebody, and then all of a sudden I felt Tehran kind of out the corner of my eye going, just level somebody and clear the way. And Drew still rushing everyone. Yeah. Drew, what? <laughs> Drew got a rushing touchdown. Yeah, so we good. It's all good. Yeah. Ten plays, ten runs. 9.4 yards per carry, the type of drive that even league veterans have never seen. I don't know if I've, I've done that one in the NFL before, so that was uh, definitely a first. But, uh, you know, um, again, I mean, that's the, if you can do that, you're going to have, you know, a, a good game. So good that it was the first time since the 1957 Browns that any team rushed for more than 295 yards and six touchdowns in one game. The definition of domination. Reporting on the Saints, I'm Chris Hagan for the final play. Coming up, the boot is staying in Baton Rouge as LSU pushes aside Arkansas and Tulane's bowl hopes remain alive after an overtime win in East Carolina. We'll recap college football when we come back on the final play. The defense holds. Justice does prevail. The final play. The big difference between LSU winning and losing at Alabama last week, Danny Etling's inability to connect on the deep ball. Against Arkansas yesterday, Etling bounced back in a big way with some big throws down the field. Chris Hagan looks back at LSU's win over the Razorbacks. 
Ed Ogeron's led the Tigers into battle against Arkansas twice now, and both times they've walked away with big wins. Last year, it was Darius Geis front and center with more than 250 yards rushing in Fayetteville. This time, it was the passing game in DJ Chark with his first two touchdown receptions of the season, leading LSU to a 23-point victory. It's, it's, it's a great feeling. Uh, me and Danny worked very hard this week. Um, just me and him trying to get things to work on our deep passes, uh, and we was able to show it tonight. For quarterback Danny Etling, it was a bit of a redemption game. A bit down on himself after missed throws against Alabama, the senior quarterback wanted to put a much better performance on the field for the home crowd. He's a hell of a teammate, a hell of a player, and, and a hell of a brother for all of us on the team. And uh, we, we really appreciate him. But perhaps the biggest tip of the hat should go to the LSU coaching staff. One of Les Miles' biggest failures was letting Alabama beat them not once, but twice, and getting blown out by Arkansas in 2014 and 2015. That's not the case anymore. When you play Alabama, you know, it's like one of the toughest games, like far as in the trenches, battling four quarters. So when you play them, you just want to carry that over to the next game. And we knew that we had three SEC games left after the Bama game. You know, either we can let the Bama game, you know, just stop our, you know, mo motivation or we can use it as motivation. And we chose to use it as motivation by coming together and just, you know, getting back to practice and just getting back to doing what we do. Everyone, everyone feels good, you know, especially after a loss. You get that, that stomach in your, that, you know, that feeling in your pit of your stomach and you're trying to get it out. So I think uh, we did that today. And that's where Ed Ogeron's truly left his mark this season, not letting this team quit despite some unfortunate setbacks. Reporting on the Tigers, I'm Chris Hagan for the final play. The AP poll for week number 12 is out and it's back to where it should be. Alabama on top at number one. They're 10-0. Miami two, Oklahoma three, Clemson up to four, Wisconsin number five. The Auburn Tigers at the whipping up on Georgia. They're at number six. On the notables page, the Bulldogs fall down to number seven below Auburn, followed by AAC members Central Florida at 14. Mississippi State played Bama close there at 17. Memphis 18. The LSU Tigers are back in the top 25 at number 21. And at number 23, South Florida, they are 8 and 1. To become bowl eligible, Tulane knows what it has to do, win its final three games, and two of those wins have to come on the road. One down, two more wins to go after Saturday's big overtime win at East Carolina. This game came down to quarterback Jonathan Banks making a play with his legs. A 16-yard touchdown run on a fourth and one to give the Wave a 31-24 lead. And the Greenies defense bowed up, getting a fourth down stop of its own on its own one-yard line. The 31-24 win was not only Tulane's first road win this season, but it also stopped a four-game slide. Up the road with Nickel State, and the Colonels picked up their eighth win of the season yesterday, running past Stephen F. Austin 34-13. The story was the Colonels' running game. They churned out over 400 yards on the ground, led by Taj Smith, who had 177 yards, and Kieran Irvin, he gave him 160 on the ground. Quarterback Chase Forcade also threw a couple of third-quarter touchdowns as the Colonels picked up their sixth straight win. On the scoreboard, not a good day for the Raging Cajuns, though, as they struggled in Oxford last night, losing 50-22 to, to Ole Miss. And Southern wins another tune-up for the Bayou Classic, which is just two weeks away. The Jags beat Texas Southern 33-7. To, to the high schools we go for Week 11's Play of the Week, and it comes from Anthony Puka Williams. The Hondo Tiger ran like a man on fire Friday. This 58-yard touchdown was his fifth of the game as he went for 303 yards rushing against Denham Springs. He'll be a force to reckon with as these playoffs keep on going. And we can't help but put Puka on the voting sheet for Player of the Week honors. What a night he had in Hanville's playoff opening win over Denham Springs. And that St. Aug defense is salty. They had five picks against Jesuit as they move on in the playoff second round. And the St. Paul's Wolves had themselves a quarterback, Jack Mashburn. He threw for 269 yards, also had a score. He also ran at 144 yards and had two more scores. And St. Paul's win against Holy Cross. Head over to fox8live.com slash player to cast your vote. By the way, voting begins on Monday and closes Wednesday night. And for an in-depth rundown on the first week of playoff football, head over to Fox 8's news app or fox8live.com for highlights and the latest recruiting news, power rankings, and a preview of next week's action.
Volleyball championships have come and gone now over the weekend. In Division I, your winner is Mount Carmel. Division III, Vanderbilt Catholic. And Division IV, Pope John Paul II. Division V, Country Day is a champion. Congratulations to all of our teams winning trophies this weekend. Coming up, the Pelicans have picked up their play and along the way picked up some wins. How they've done it and what's ahead for Alvin Gentry's men, that's next on the final play. in the shadows, biding their time until a little more attention comes their way, are the Pelicans, who, like it or not, are becoming less and less of a sleeping giant in the Western Conference. While they were on the road last week, they figured some things out, like how to get their record above 500 for the first time under head coach Alvin Gentry. Here's Garland Gillis. The Pelicans inch back over 500 for the season with an emphatic win over the Clippers Saturday night. After a successful road trip, it appears the Pels are headed in the right direction. For us, we're just trying to put a string of wins together. You know, we did a great job on the road going 3-1 and one and coming back. We got to take care of home court. So that's what we're trying to do. Started tonight. Um, came out with a lot of energy. Um, shot well from the field. Guys stepped up, made shots, and we shared the basketball play for each other. DeMarcus Cousins dropped 35 points on the Clippers. The Brow contributed with 25. The front court mates both sit in the top 10 of the NBA in points per game. It's not about, you know, who's scoring the ball. Who night it is is about winning the game at the end of the night. You know, any given night could be a guy's night. It's not all rosy for the Pelicans. They did turn the ball over 23 times last night. What's the what's the, what, what the guy do from the little Giants? <laughs> I'm gonna start off with some of that because you know I'm I'm the main culprit of you know the turnovers right now. Um, I just, I just gotta. Nah, it was me. I had a. It was me. I had a. Yeah. The Pelicans could have a solution to those turnover problems, and it could start Friday with the return of Rajon Rondo. He'll have a lot to do with those going down. Uh, I just think we can't, you know, we uh, we make some tough decisions in, in tough situations, and we're trying to pass the ball in a real confined area. And what we got to do is that we got to maintain our spacing and then move the basketball. Covering the Pelicans, Garland Gillen for the final play. And the team will be home for four of its next five games beginning tomorrow night with the Hawks in town. The Raptors come to the Smoothie King Center on Wednesday. After that, it's a quick Friday night visit to Denver to take on the Nuggets before coming back home to face OKC on the 20th. And just before Thanksgiving, they will host the San Antonio Spurs. And that's our show for tonight. For all of us here at Fox 8, I'm Juan Kincaid. We hope you'll join us again next Sunday night for the final play. From Fox 8 Sports, this has been The Final Play.